Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Joining me today, David Lammy, Labour MP for Tottenham, who uh, is a Remainer and is pro that third runway, a decision made this week. Theresa Villas, Conservative MP for Chipping Barnet, is also here, a leading Brexiteer and opponent of third runway. What um, symmetry. Welcome um, to you both. Uh, let's start with the review of London's preparedness to deal with terrorism, which was published this week. It had more than 120 recommendations in it, but broadly speaking, finds the capital pretty well placed. Did you think that? I mean, what did you pick out of it? Yes, I think Lord Harris was, was positive about London's ability to withstand a terrorist attack. But I think he also had some helpful suggestions. This is a sort of area where there is always more work that can be done. Some of his suggestions I, I don't think would necessarily work, but um, overall I think this is a helpful contribution. Like, like, the, like the one he uh, thinks that we should be spending more attention, uh, more time looking at merging the city force with the Met. You don't think going along with that? I think those kind of structural reorganisations in relation, for example, to the British Transport Police in the city, I think they would probably be a bit of a distraction. I don't think that uh, that should be the priority when it comes to countering terrorism. I think what is also useful from this report is that it is a reminder that um, these attacks you know, are such a significant threat to London and could happen at any time. So um, Tories at the London Assembly is kind of suggesting their reaction this week that this was, it was a little bit sort of bland, a little bit unfocused, but, you know, I, I presume you can argue that number of recommendations is also pretty detailed. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think it's surprising, for example, that S Sadiq Khan or the Mayor of London is not going to Cobra meetings, and that ought to absolutely happen. Um, uh, the meetings of that gathering of security experts and politicians that always happens, we should make clear, the Cabinet Committee yeah. at a time of crisis, at a time of fear. And, and let's remember, you know, just last week, someone was arrested on the Jubilee line with what people apparently looked like a, a bomb. So this is serious. The police have thwarted 50, 50 attacks since um, 2005. And actually, um, I think Lord Harris has done a really comprehensive job. Things like alerts across London on our mobile phones so we can all be in touch, we can all stay connected. Actually, that ought to be happening and, routinely. And finding that the 600 extra armed officers that the capital was already getting, um, Home Office, uh, uh, the government had, had uh, authorised as well, that that's enough. Actually, we don't need um, any more. Uh, it might send the wrong impression, psychosocial impression, he describes it as, to the capital that were too militaristic or whatever. Do you agree with that? I would have thought there's a balance to be struck dependent on, um, you know, what's going on. And clearly global affairs and international policy can sometimes drive um, uh, the urgency, if you like, of our response. So I would want to keep that as a question mark. Would you like to see more uh, armed, armed officers? Is that what people are telling you? They'd like more armed reassurance? Well, I think there is already a lot of work being done on that. I know that um, the Met takes this very seriously, as does the Home Office, and I'm sure the Mayor as well. Uh, so I, I think the report's quite interesting on that. There is, a, there is a balance to be struck. And so, I mean, I don't think sort of huge numbers of extra sort of armed police is, is necessarily um, required in this instance. I think what is crucial is that we complete the investigatory powers bill in the House of Commons and Parliament because without those powers our intelligence services are going to find themselves progressively less and less able to um, detect these plots before they happen and, mm. and prevent harm. Worth a um, programme in itself. Um, let's um, move on. So the government finally took the plunge and gave its backing to a third runway at Heathrow. But there's quite a journey ahead, full of challenges, political, planning and legal. Let's get up to speed with this from Tanjil Rashid. At last, the government's green light for a third runway at Heathrow. We believe a third runway for Heathrow is the best option for our future. It's the best for the whole country to kind of create better connectivity to the different regions of the United Kingdom and to provide the best trade links to the world. So London's airport capacity is set to be increased. If everything goes to plan, that is. And there's reason to believe it might not. No ifs, no buts, no third runway. Opposition across London is strong. Residents near Heathrow have concerns about noise and air pollution and political opposition is mounting. Are you still going to oppose Heathrow, Boris? 
One of the most high-profile conservative backbenchers, Zach Goldsmith, has resigned to fight a by-election as an independent anti-Heathrow candidate. This project is almost certainly not going to be delivered. I believe this will be a millstone around this government's neck for many, many years to come. Constant source of delay, constant sort of source of anger and betrayal. But even though the Tories won't be standing a candidate against him, observers say there's a very strong chance the Lib Dems might win their old seat back. <laughs> The Prime Minister is expected to have enough votes in Parliament for a third runway, by almost two-thirds, according to a Comres poll, but the question might not be settled in Parliament at all. At least five local councils, including Theresa May's own in Windsor and Maidenhead, will be fighting the decision in the courts. They may even be getting some help from the Mayor of London. I think this is the wrong decision for London and the whole of uh, Britain. I think the government is riding roughshod over Londoners' uh, views. We're speaking to local councils now and exploring helping them in relation to digital challenges. Heathrow may have got the green light from the government, but following a potential judicial review into the environmental impact on locals, it might be looking at a red light from the courts. Um, David, let's start with you. Um, how much time should Sadiq Khan be spending continuing to oppose uh, this? You just get on with it. Look, Sadiq's got to take his view on behalf of London, and he's clear he would have preferred Gatwick. He was a Which South... view is that, by the way, of course, because he had a different one, didn't he? Well, well but I think you pointed that out in the mayoral campaign, know, didn't you? During the mayoral campaign, when I wanted to be mayor, right. I was very keen to, to point out that right. Sadiq had flip-flopped on it. But it, oh, yeah. it, it right. does feel that he is absolutely clear that it should have been Gatwick. In his view now. He, he's yeah. entitled to take, to take that view. But he must also, I think, agree that we've got to move on. You know, there are real issues about um, a lack of capacity. And in a post-Brexit environment, particularly where London could lose out, we've got to increase air, air, air capacity. And therefore, the government having settled on Heathrow, what I'm hoping now is that we can actually move forward and not just get stuck on the same old record, a record that has been turning now for absolutely decades. Theresa, when it is so controversial, when they have waited uh, so long. We've had Davis, then we've had a big delay after Davis. As you pointed out before we started recording, you've talked about it in this studio so many times, going back so many years. They wouldn't make this decision if it wasn't doable. It couldn't happen eventually, would you not say? Well, I think there's a reason why people have been talking about a third runway at Heathrow for 40 years and not built it. It's because it's a really bad idea. <laughs> this project is undeliverable. We've heard about the huge legal problems. And remember, this construction project involves either tunnelling the M25 or somehow building a runway on a bridge over the M25. But if the logic and that's so before be... you get into the fact that Heathrow is already the biggest noise polluter <laughs> in Europe. There are so many reasons why this is a bad idea, and yet Gatwick, we could deliver in half the time, half the cost, but fraction that of the simple point, if the logic is so obvious, how, why have they made this decision then? It's, it, it can't be that simple, can it? It, it? It's so frustrating, the sort of fixation of the establishment on Heathrow is getting in the way of actually delivering a new runway. And I, I agree we need airport capacity, but the only way to deliver it in the southeast is via Gatwick, because the problems with Heathrow are just too great. Look, there have always been West London MPs or MPs in the flight path that are against it. That's the bottom line. Business and industry are for it. Um, the unions are for it. Huge amounts of jobs will come as a consequence. And might I just say, London's young people, 10,000 plus apprentices. Uh, but most importantly, this is actually the economy of West London, where the airport's situated, is the most important economy currently in Europe. Let us grow it so that all of the country can benefit. It looks like the SNP are going to support uh, this proposal, so it will get through Parliament. Well, if, Let's if, get on if with there it are the votes, and not let the NIMBY if stop that it. Is the final, if that is uh, going to be a crucial decision and there are the votes in favour of it, what do you think it is that will stop it, that will make it undeliverable if it goes and gets that political cross-party endorsement? Well, I and others, and I would point out I'm not a West London MP. My constituency, mm. thankfully, is not under the flight path, so it's not just um, people who are concerned about their backyard who oppose this, this proposal. I think I will continue to make the case as part of this long process which the government's undertaken uh, for the better alternative, which is Gatwick. You know, that is... You know, Gatwick has been transformed as an airport since BAA, as it then was, was forced to sell it. 
Uh, the competition between our airports has dramatically improved the services uh, available at Gatwick. It's passed 42 million passengers. It's a great option. Can I just ask from you, I mean, you feel very strongly about it. Um, why would you have never have considered, or why don't you make it a, a kind of resigning an issue and follow what Zach Goldsmith does? Well, I, I, people in politics care passionately about all sorts of issues, but it's very rare to trigger a by-election about these matters. I respect the decision he's made. That was part of the platform, platform on which he stood at the general election, but um, so it's clear I didn't people. make a similar promise. Would you go and campaign for him during this um, by-election? Uh, certainly I would support his campaign, yes. You'd go out and campaign. Do you yeah. expect front benchers, do you think, for key figures in the party to go and do that now? Um, I don't know what their intentions would be, but certainly I'd be very happy to help Zach. You the have party. to uh, agree, don't you, um, David Lambert, that it's going to be a pretty um, rugged, tough protest with four local authorities, Conservative-run local authorities, in the wings, client earth, various environmental groups. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. Uh, there are issues, I think, still to bottom out in relation to pollution, uh, genuinely, um, and noise, uh, specifically for those in the area. Um, it is very likely we won't get there until actually I've retired. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's such oh. a lot, 15, 20 years. So, uh, but that's more reason to have settled on a position and work through the problems and the challenges. Ready to go off and fly <laughs> off somewhere to enjoy your retirement. Final word. But, but going back, I mean, we very were quickly. here eight years ago with Jeff Hoon. He predicted that technology would fix these pollution problems. He was wrong then, and I'm afraid the government's wrong now about this. Well, well don't forget the oh. Davis Commission said that they were satisfied that the, uh, you know, on carbon emissions, the standard was met. And uh, they did look at this in detail. With, with, I think we'll all agree, with a lot of work to be done over the next few years. Anyway, let's um, move on. We've touched on Brexit a little bit already, but it's 30 years since the Big Bang, the process of deregulation, which enabled the city to become a world leader in financial services. This week, the Mayor, Sadiq Khan, and senior figures from the City Corporation issued fresh warnings about the risk to that status from a so-called hard Brexit, as Dan Friedman reports. Despite being a financial powerhouse and home to hundreds of banks in the early 1980s, London was thought to be in danger of falling behind rivals in New York. The Thatcher government believed that reform was needed, and rather than introduce it gradually, they decided it should all come into force overnight in what became known as the Big Bang. On Monday, October the 27th, 1986, the London Stock Exchange was deregulated. Gone were the crowded and chaotic trading floors that bred inefficiency, replaced by electronic screen-based trading. And for the first time, foreign firms could buy up and own some of London's financial crown jewels. That was the trigger of the gun being pulled, saying, ladies and gentlemen worldwide, London is open for international business and we are here, and wallop. The bonuses started to be very good, and of course, within five years, they hit the, hit the skies. Over the next 30 years, London became arguably the world's foremost financial centre, employing nearly three quarters of a million people today. Our time zone, proximity, and access to the European single market make London an attractive base for American and Far Eastern firms. Under EU passporting rules, those companies' location here enables them to sell their services right across the Union. Meanwhile, free movement of people means Europe's best talent have made London their home. But now, depending on the deal that we get with Europe, Brexit could mean the loss of passporting and free movement. So some firms in London are exploring their options elsewhere across the continent. The Big Bang helped London secure its position as the market leader for financial services. But now, 30 years on after Brexit, could this be the turning point that begins the decline? If we get a Brexit that largely maintains the ability of financial institutions based in Britain to operate in the European Union, and those in the European Union to operate in Britain, then the effect on jobs in London, jobs in the country, will be minimal. If we don't get that, there'll be loss of some functions over time and therefore some jobs and a lot of tax revenue. The scenario is from a couple of thousand. If there's a, a Brexit that leaves us roughly where we are to perhaps as many as 75,000, if we have no access to the single market beyond that of any other country. But David Buick believes that our closest European rivals are anything but. Frankfurt, don't want to be disrespectful, but I'm going to be. It's a town. 
Paris, five and a half million people. Take them 10 years to build the infrastructure. We don't have time. Regardless of the economic arguments for London retaining its status as a financial centre of Europe, Brexit negotiations mean there are serious political considerations too. The whole argument for Brexit was that European politicians do economically self-defeating things all of the time. You shouldn't be surprised if Paris or, or Berlin are now going to try to capitalise on Britain leaving the EU to, in a potentially feudal effort to turn their own cities into a European financial hub. I mean, you eventually run into economic reality in some form, but the politicians can keep going for an awfully long time before they do it. This week, another big British economic project did finally receive political backing, but Heathrow watchers who've seen politics trump economics on that issue for decades will be wary of European leaders who have to balance their own political realities with broader economic ones. And uh, David, uh, big car firms saying they are going to start investing more um, in this country. Um, the city showing that it's resilient. It's always shown it's come up with new solutions and new ways of, of, of keeping its sort of preeminent position. Um, there's a lot of exaggerated fear here, isn't there? <laughs> no, I don't think so. We're living in very, very serious times in which the pound is falling, in which we're hearing very consistently from our major banks and from the city that if we don't get those passporting rules, they are off. And frankly, with an economy in Britain, and this is the fundamental point, where 80% of our economy is based on services, we are not manufacturing in the way we were before the Big Bang. If we lose this, then those services could go. They could go elsewhere and they will go elsewhere. Why wouldn't they, is the point. Why would the city figures, why would they bother to warn um, if it wasn't a genuine threat? Well, it's very important that during the Brexit negotiations, um, the UK looks to see, um, to do everything we can to safeguard our financial centre. And I believe that that is deliverable. Uh, as you say, London has always been resilient. It is the most successful financial centre on earth. It's in the interests of both the United Kingdom and the continuing EU that London continues to be successful because it serves businesses throughout do Europe. Do you expect they don't them to have their a passporting arrangement? Do you expect there to be no loss of any kind of strength of position? The current arrangements will be transferred across in a, in a post-Brexit world. I think we can deliver passporting type arrangements. Um, but I also think it's, it's crucial to recognise that um, actually London has all sorts of business across Europe which doesn't involve the passport anyway because of the focus on wholesale markets. It is possible to deliver a successful outcome through the, these negotiations for the city because it's in the interest of both sides that we do. It's Sorry, shaking your head. It's, it's the service economy, it's the accountants, it's the consultants, it's the lawyers. All of that comes off the back of that trading. That's why passporting is so important. Why would the European Union give us those rights when we've effectively rejected it? They'll want it for the European Union. So it's all well and good to say, I think we can get it. That, I think particularly if we actually move forward with Article 50, is going to lead to an enormous slide in our economy next year. But, Others say but that. I think it's not good enough. It's so, not good enough. So far you have been proved wrong in terms of the economic shock that you and other Remainers were predicting. The economic shock happens. How, how do we account for third quarter figures? That, 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 Tim, that GDP, Tim, it's Tim, actually going up. Tim, the economic shock happens the moment we press the Article 50 button. That's what right. I'm sorry, no. I mean, you, uh, and you most other economists are saying as soon as the vote It's the happens. first quarter of next year Therese, we'll really see the hit. Therese, sorry, carry on. I, I, look, the city is going to be resilient. I believe that uh, we will get a good trading deal from the European Union because it's manifestly in their interests that we do so. And remember, most member states have nothing resembling their own financial centre. They're going to continue to depend on London. They won't take kindly to their businesses being told that they don't have access to those deep and liquid capital markets, which frankly no other financial centre in Europe can ever possibly match. The reality is, if there is a politically driven attempt to try and undermine London's place as Europe's financial centre, the only people who are going to gain are New York. You know, they, this is in our interests, in the EU's interest, to make sure we have an orderly transition to a new trading relationship on financial services.
Of course, it's in the EU's interest to have a trading relationship, but it's also in the EU's interest to preserve the EU. And, and in many countries in the EU, there are movements afoot to, to, to leave also. And for those reasons, I'm afraid, when we get to the negotiation, as has been said by European leaders, it will be hardball. And there's much that we have now which we will no longer have. Ten seconds to reassure, to come back. London is going to continue to be the biggest and best financial centre on the planet. And it is in the interests of the UK and the EU that that continues. Uh, the EU's already got enough problems with financial markets, with okay. the crisis in its banking. They, it's not in their interest to try and wreck Great. the city. Thank you. Let's um, move on. Now for the rest of the political news in 60 seconds. Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson has been urged to do more for Anglo-Iranian aid worker Nazanin Zakari Ratcliffe, detained in Iran, accused of espionage. The 37-year-old charity worker from Hampstead was originally arrested at Tehran Airport on April the 3rd, along with her two-year-old daughter. Sadiq Khan has met with a cross-party group of London MPs to support a push for a devolution deal in the autumn statement. The mayor argued that giving City Hall and London's boroughs more control would allow the city to better manage the potential economic impact of Brexit. Wimbledon MP Stephen Hammond raised the issue of Crossrail 2 at Prime Minister's Question Time. Could my right honourable friend assure me that the government still supports Crossrail 2 and will she ask the Secretary of State to set out the timetable for the delayed consultation? Very We're waiting uh, to see a robust business case and uh, a proper funding proposal in relation to Crossrail 2. But very quickly, at the end of the week, a private member's bill on homelessness uh, got through, got government support. Um, it's going to allow local authorities or, or give them the obligation to actually do much more for people who are uh, thrown out of their private rented homes. What did you feel about it? I, I felt it was a good day for Parliament. I have huge respect for my colleague Bob Blackman, who's taking this bill forward, because it will help some of the most vulnerable com people in our community avoid homelessness. It's, it's the biggest sort of upgrade and modernisation of our laws on homelessness that we've seen in this country for 40 years. And it did years. show a lot of collaboration yeah. across parties. Of course it was cross-party because right across London we could see the chronic homelessness on our streets. There are kids without homes in London. But the question will be, can we give local government in London the resources to meet these statutory obligations if we're to put them on the books? And the other question which everyone was raising, well, we wouldn't be in this position if you guys were just building more houses. Well, all parties accept the need to build more houses and we are making real progress. I mean, for example, you know, the, the borough I live in, Barnet, is delivering more houses than any other in outer London. Things are changing. Labour were, you know, they failed to deliver us the homes we need. We're determined to do better. OK, um, it's really good to uh, see you both. Uh, Theresa Villiers, um, David Lammy, thanks very much for coming in. I've been getting away with it all.